Excellent. Thank you very much. Helen, thank you. What a terrific introduction, and I am uh, very proud of Helen and our friendship and all that she has done in her community, not only as a journalist, a renowned journalist, but also uh, in her volunteer work here at Miami-Dade College, where she is uh, such a big part of the success of this great institution. I'm delighted to be with you today and delighted to talk to you about my book. It is about acquiring a sense of belonging, and that's what the title is about. First, let me tell you why I wrote the book. As a result of a lifetime of telling a story to people who would I would encounter in many walks of life, it was clear to me that it was a story that people wanted to always hear more about. It was one of those things that as dinner conversation would shift to saying, so how old were you when you came? And you came alone? And how was that? And how come your parents sent you? It really was no way to shorten the conversation over dinner or whatever it might have been because one question led to many others. And so I thought it was a story that needed to be told, my story, but not just my story, as the story of so many other Cuban families and the trauma that we went through in the early 60s at the height of the Cold War. So it was really not a book about politics, and it really isn't about politics. It really is about my life, but just as importantly, and I'll unfold that rest of that story, it's really about the lives that touch me and the impact that they had and how they in turn made a difference in my life, which I hope will serve as encouragement as well as modeling because I think that is one of the greatness of America is the fact that this is a caring nation. This is a nation that really does care one for the other. My book begins uh, with a retrospective look between my mother and I at the, at the airport in Havana as I am about to board the plane. My father, by the way, being the heavy, strong guy, and a big part of this book is about him, really wasn't strong enough to go to the airport. So he told me goodbye in Sahuala Grande, a small city where we lived and where I had grown up. My mom, being the, the weaker sex, was a tough one that went to the airport to see me off. And um, so I can remember her standing uh, uh, on the terrace at Rancho Valleros Airport right there, which I'm sure many in this audience would understand and readily recall that image. And she was up there in that terrace as I was going up the steps of this airplane. Uh, and I remember the stairs were on the back of the airplane. And I remember looking back through this airplane and, and then up to her and, and, and seeing the, the desperation that I saw in her eyes, I will never forget. It was the same desperation that I had seen earlier that day as we were in that fishbowl that was at the airport where we spent in a glass room hours and hours before boarding the plane. But the book then does a, a, a flash forward, if you will, to another day when our eyes met, and it was that day that Helen talked about, which is the day in which I took my oath as a United States Senator. And she was in the gallery, and I can remember just after I finished taking my oath, and I had uh, pulled back, looking up to see if I could find exactly where my family was. And my mother immediately stood up and blew a kiss to me. And uh, it was a, a sort of a connecting back of those two moments and what a difference in a, in a matter of 40 some years life had made. But the book begins with my describing of my childhood in Cuba. And it was a, a wonderful growing up experience. It was a wonderful childhood. My father was a veterinarian in a, in a small city. My family was very well known there. And we were uh, in a very comfortable sort of environment to grow up in. Uh, I went to the same school my father had gone to. I had uh, a, a wonderful extended nurturing family all around me and a very safe surrounding where I rode my bike to all corners of that city. But one of the things that I remember the most was trips to the country with my dad where he was looking out after animals and uh, going with him and, and being a part of that wonderful life of just following my dad around and carrying his bag as he went to see a, uh, a sick animal in somebody's farm. Or the most vivid memories that I have of Cuba and the one thing I long to return to is the beach in the summer. And in the summertime, my grandfather had built a, a, a small house. It was a little wooden house, and it was a, a fairly primitive little place by today's summer house standards. And it wasn't really anything fancy, but we would go there and spend uh, the better part of the summer. And I would just, uh, as I grew older, I would uh, row my little uh, rowboat and uh, throw a cast net and catch bait and fish. And it was just a wonderful existence. And my life centered around my school. And uh, playing ball was a big part of my life. Baseball, of course, like most Cuban young kids, but also basketball. Since I was a little taller than most Cubans, I did a good interpretation of Shaq uh, with, 
but anyway, uh, th that was all part of a safe and wonderful, secure growing up. It all became uh, tumbling down as the upheaval of Castro's revolution, which is well chronicled, but as it impacted me, it was a great, a great change and a great upheaval. And it didn't take long after the Castro takeover until things began to change in a very dramatic way, in a way that began to frighten my parents about our future and about what the future held, about the loss of human rights, about the loss of freedom, about the uh, persecution of, uh, of religious beliefs, and about the, the closing of our Catholic schools where I had gone to school, and as I said earlier, where my father had also attended. And all of a sudden, life became very, very different, and my parents became very, very frightened. And it led to a moment in time when uh, uh, they uh, fear for my life, where they feared that I might be one of those that was singled out because of my own willingness to just accept the new, the new order. And uh, that manifested itself in a basketball game, if you can imagine, of just a, a basketball game of, uh, among kids where um, uh, one city was playing the other, and uh, some folks had come from Santa Clara, which is a larger city, and uh, they had come in a bus, and some of them were armed with machine guns, which was not that unusual in Cuba then uh, at, in the aftermath of the revolution. And I was wearing my scapular, a symbol of my faith, which in those days was not a popular thing to do. But I wanted to do it because I wasn't going to uh, simply be frightened into not expressing my, my faith in that small way. But this became threatening, and all of a sudden my parents could hear as they sat in, in the chairs watching me play basketball that these armed people were, were yelling things at me and, and calling me names and, and saying, kill the Catholic and things like that. Well, that basketball game became much more than a basketball game. It became a, a turning point on a watershed. My parents immediately began, they had heard already of this Peter Pan program, which wasn't called that at the time. It was just uh, the kids were leaving and going to the U.S. and going to Miami, uh, which to me was the U.S. That's all that there was here was Miami, and, uh, and began to make plans for me to leave. And I can remember vividly sitting at the corner of their bed in their bedroom as they closed the door and told me that we had to have a very serious conversation about my future and whether or not it would not be time for me to leave and to go into this Peter Pan program where others of my friends already had gone. And so they told me they wanted me to do this, but that they wouldn't have me do it unless I was for it, unless I was willing. And so I actually uh, made the decision for myself to acquiesce with theirs and take the step to, to, to leave the country. Arriving here in Miami at Miami Airport uh, at about 6 o'clock at night, it's an image I never will forget. The sun was about to set, February the 6th of 1962. And as the sun was setting, I was uh, all of a sudden beginning this new life. And how it immediately manifested itself most vividly to me was the fact that I was then uh, immediately segregated from all the other arriving passengers. And we were the children traveling alone. And an immigration officer immediately segregated us aside. And that was the last time I felt normal for about four years or so until my parents and I were then reunited. And it was this feeling of now we're no longer with families, we're no longer with everybody else, but it was us kids. We were taken to Camp Matecumbe, which uh, uh, is way south of here, not Matecumbe Key down in the Keys, but right here in, in South Miami. And uh, there it began my life of adjustment and evolution. It was a, a difficult situation in the first months. Obviously, this was an overcrowded camp, about 450 of us kids. And I was in a camp for children between the ages of 14 and 18. Um, and uh, it was a, a safe uh, place, but there was not a lot of nurturing or a lot of uh, touchy-feely there because it was a busy place. And we were there to be relocated to another place. And as Helen said, I then went on to Jacksonville, but my good fortune was that by June of that summer, I was placed in a foster home, in a foster family in Orlando, Florida. And it was Walter and Eileen Young, and their two sons, Dennis and, and Jimmy, who opened their home to me and who uh, said, welcome, this is your new home. And it was a very frightening prospect because I didn't speak the language. I never really knew an American person. I never had talked to one. I never had had any interaction with one. I've been in these camps, and basically they were run by other Cuban families or Cuban refugees that were there. And ultimately, my, uh, my shock was that these people were just like everybody else that I had ever known, 
but they were Americans, and somehow that made them different. We uh, immediately attempted to communicate, and that was not easy. They didn't speak my language. I didn't speak theirs. And I'll tell you a cute anecdote. Uh, shortly after I get to their house, it's now like at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. This is in June of 62. And Mrs. Young says to me, well, she's trying to communicate to me that she was going to feed me something. I hadn't eaten all day since breakfast, been traveling and all of that. And so in her uh, wonderful way, she said, well, what is every boy like? What could I feed him that every kind of universal? So she figured, well, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Now, that seems rather normal. But if you're from Cuba and you've never seen peanut butter and uh, they show it to you, it doesn't really look like something you want to be eating. 